Now, as I've mentioned, on a postscript to topic 5.7, I said something, but I forgot to write it down when I said it. So if you spot that or spot a little error somewhere, remember, make a note of the time and what the error was, and I can give you a bonus point. That's because you're watching carefully. All right, we're going to go on now to topic 5.8, which are applications of polynomial equations. And we're going to look at problem solving, which is what applications are. We'll look at the Pythagorean theorem. And then we'll just take a very brief look at this because we're not going to go into that in any great depth, fitting polynomial functions to data. So let's get started. And here again, I do have a section in which I did some board work on this. And I also did the additional exercises. But the nice thing about this is they have it really laid out in lots of detail. But there's lots of reading, and I don't want to make the uh, tape too long. So let's take a look at this. So race numbers. Terry and Jody each entered a boat in the Lakeport race. The racing number of their boats were consecutive numbers, the product of which was this. Find the numbers. OK. Now, some of you might try to find this by using arithmetic. And that would be good. But again, on a test, you need to show the work that you got to the answer by doing, in this case, what will be a quadratic equation. Now, they do give us lots of things, but let me work this one out a little bit for you. With the picture, now what are consecutive numbers? Well, you might recall we have 5, 6, 7. These are consecutive numbers. Now, how do we put that into algebra? Well, the 5 would be an x. The 6 is one more than that, so it would be x plus 1. And 7 would be x plus 2. Now, if they were consecutive even numbers, we would have 6, 8, 10. x would be our first number. Our next consecutive even number would be x plus 2. And the next even number would be x plus 4. Now, sort of an enigma here is how about if they were consecutive odd numbers? Well, that would be 7, 9, 11. So 7 is your first number. How do I get to 9? Well, this is the strange part. I add 2 to it. Now, this usually messes up a student's mind that we're adding 2. But the key is you're starting with an odd. Adding 2 to an odd give you the next odd. Adding 2 to an even gives you the next even. So these, the algebraic parts, are the same for both consecutive odd and even. The key is, what is your first number? If that's even, adding 2 will give you even. If that's odd, adding 2 will give you odd. OK, that was just an aside, because what we're looking at here is two consecutive numbers. So we're going to have x, 
and they're saying the product of that is equal to 156. So we distribute that. We transpose the 56 to the other side. And let's write that correctly here. And then we're going to factor this. Now, you might say, well, what are the factors of 156? So I'm not going to do this for everyone, but I'll show you a strategy once again to figure this out. And again, i got to write it properly here. What we're going to do is get the prime factorization of 156. So I know I can take a 2 out into there, and that gives me uh, 78. And I can take a 2 out of there, and that gives me 34. And I can take a 2 out of there, and that gives me a 17. So, let me check this here. And I see I had a little error there already. It's uh, uh, 2 goes into 7 three times, but there's 1 left over. So it's 2 into 18 uh, nine times. And then I can take a 3 into there. So, what do I have here? Well, 2 times 2 is 4, times 3 is 12. So 12 times 13 is 156. So those will be my factorizations. Now I need a negative, a positive there, and a negative there, I believe. OK. So when I solve this, I get x equals 12. And here, x equals a negative 13. So we don't name a boat a negative 13. This will be boat number 12, and this will be boat number 13. And this is a technique, but you got to be careful with your arithmetic here. I'm trying to do it perhaps a little too fast. So let's see what they show us here. We did all of that. We did all the factoring. And again, we would reject the 13, the negative 13. We used the 12, and consecutive numbers would be 12 and 13. OK, let's take a look at this dimension of a leaf. It's approximately a triangle, has this as an area. And if the leaf is 12 inch longer than it's wide, find the length and width of the leaf. OK. Well, again, they're going to give you this, and you could read it. But I will do it for scratch if they're not giving all of this. So we have a triangle. I would make a picture. Now the formula of a triangle is area equals one half the base times the height. So we need to know that. Now they're saying that the area is going to be 320. And we can just fill in some of the stuff here. And we know that the leaf is longer than it's wide. So its base is going to be x. And the height, this, so this is going to be x. And the height is 
12 inch longer than its width, so this will be x plus 12. So there's our formula. Now, if I go through solving all of this, the, the tape is going to be quite long. Again, all of the work is there. But what we want to do is do a strategy in converting English into algebra. But to solve this, I would multiply both sides by 2. And then I would get rid of this. So this is going to be 640 equals x squared plus 12x. And this will be x squared plus 12x. Transpose that, a negative 640 equals 0. And we're going to factor that. So since they have it all worked out, we could take a quick look at it. But basically what you wanted to do is what we've done. OK, they multiplied both sides by 2. They got this. They transposed. OK. And there, there are the factors. And it would be a little difficult in figuring out these factors. But again, I'd use that technique of 640, get the primordial, or the prime factors, I should say. <laughs> Not primordial. Prime factors, and uh, figure out what your factors would be. OK. Let's go to medicine here. For certain people suffering an extreme allergic reaction, the drug epinephrine, which is a form of adrenaline, is sometimes subscribed or prescribed. The number of milligrams of epinephrine in an adult bloodstream T minutes after 250 micrograms have been injected can be approximated by this formula. OK. so. What we're going to put here is this is going to equal 250, I believe. You put the 250 right there. OK, and they usually have this in sort of a pen form. Uh, my granddaughter has a little allergy to peanuts. So the school nurse has one, and their mother has one. And I don't know if she keeps one in her purse. That can be life-threatening if you don't have this. OK, so let's take a look at it. No, I went too far then. No, let's see. OK, how long after an injection Will there be about this many micrograms of epinephrine in the bloodstream? OK, so actually, you're getting a parabola. And they're asking for when will it be 210 on this parabola? You're looking for those values of x. So you will put the 210 there, and then what I would do is transpose everything to this other side. Factor out. Looks like you could factor out a 10. Let's see what they're doing here. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They're factoring out a 10, and they're getting this. This is easy to factor now. Factors of 21 that have a sum, in this case, of 10, 3, and 7. They're both going to be plus. Eventually, t is 3, t is 7. So as we see it in the curve, it starts at none. You inject. It builds up. It peaks there. They're not asking us for when it peaks. They're just asking when it has this level, 210, which is what they have here. 
And again, those would be your answers. And they state it nicely. You'll have 210 milligrams of epinephrine in the bloodstream approximately three minutes and seven minutes after the injection. Now, when would you have 250, which I believe is what they said, and that would be one, two, three, four, five, or sort of between that. At five minutes, you would have the highest dose of 250. They're not asking that question. All right, let's go on. Display of a sports card. Well, again, this is going to be a little tedious. Let's look at it, and they have it all worked out, so we'll use what they've done. A valuable sports card is four centimeters wide and five centimeters long. The card is to be sandwiched by two pieces of lucite that's like a clear plastic, each of which is five and a half times the area of the card. Okay. Determine the dimensions of the lucite that will ensure a uniform border around the card. Well, here, a drawing, I think, would be absolutely necessary. Okay? Now, they could have added this a little clearer, so let me add something here. They're saying the card is four wide and five long. Okay. So, what will be the dimension then of the lucite. Well, this lucite here is going to be, for this width, it's going to be 4 right there, plus an x on this side and an x on this side to give you 4 plus 2x. Okay, and then the length now will be the 5 plus the x up there and the x down there, which is a 2x. Now, the area of the card, the area of the card is 4 times 5 is going to be 20. Okay, so let's see what they will do. So the area of the lucite is this times this, and that will equal five and a half times, and I wouldn't put it that way. I would probably put it as, keep out the decimals too. I'd say this is 11 halves, and this we said was 20. Now, two will go into there once, two will go into there uh, 10 times. So you have 11 times 10. This over here then will equal 110. So we're going to foil this, get a quadratic expression, put this 110 over to the other side, change its sign, integrate it into this trinomial, 
equal it to zero. And again, that's what they're doing. Okay, good. And when you factor this, they took out a common two to reduce that. They factored this into that. They get x is a negative 7 and 1 half, or x is a positive 3. So, what do you do? Can you accept this negative? And the answer is no. We don't have measurements that are negative. So, this is our answer. And again, that only tells you what x is. So x, we say, is going to be 3. And then these are all 3's over here. So the lucite, then, and our x is 3, is going to be 2 times 3 is 6. This is going to be 10 centimeters. And this one is going to be 2 times 3 is 6, 11, this one over here, 11 centimeters. This one is 10. All right. Wow, that was a long one. And there was lots of stuff going on there. And the lucite should be 10 centimeters wide by 11 centimeters long. All right, Pythagorean theorem, just as a little review, what does it state? Well, there's a couple of things going on here. Pythagoras, a Greek a mathematician, sort of 500 years before the birth of Christ, he worked out that the area, or I should say the dimensions, of a triangle, if this leg was A, and in fact, let me just write it over here. And this is a right angle. If this is your leg A, and this is your leg B, B, we said the side opposite the leg was the hypotenuse, which is side C. Now, if you take the square of leg A, which let's say is 3, and they show you this over here, and you take the square of leg B, which let's say is 4, that would equal the square of C, which is what they've done right there, which is going to be 5. And let's see if it measures out. This is 9 plus 16. Does that equal 25? And it does. So they then put it in this form, and they call it the Pythagorean theorem in respect to the Greek fella that developed it. But we can use that in our calculations, which we will do for this next problem here. So they have a bridge design in which there are diagonals. So let's make our little triangle over here. Now, you could read all about it there, too. They're saying this side is x. This side is x plus 10. And they're saying the hypotenuse and the diagonal is 50. So we're going to square this side, square that side, and that will equal this squared. So we then get x squared plus square this using our special technique. 
and this is going to be 2,500 here. This becomes 2x squared plus 20x. We bring that over as a negative 2,400. Doing this in my head, and normally you should probably write it down. Now, I can, and all of that equals zero. So I could factor out a 2, and I get x squared plus 10x minus 1,200 equals zero. I think this was done correctly. Again, I'm not writing it out. I'm showing you it quickly, but let's go to the text. I think they have it all written out for us there. Perfect. That's what we had. Yes, that's what we had. And the factors that have a difference of 10 of 1,200 are 40 and 30. Now we get a negative 40 and we get a positive 30 when we do our finding the zeros. So we're going to reject the length of that as being negative 40. So what is the length? Well, if we go back to our original triangle here, This was 50, x we said was 30, and this x plus 10 is 40. Notice you have a 3, 4, 5 basic triangle there. Okay, now in this next part here, and we're approaching 30 minutes, they're talking about fitting polynomial functions to data. Well, so far, we said that if the data we had sort of lined up to a straight line, we had linear. And if it became a uh, kind of a parabola, that would be a quadratic function. Now, there are other functions, too, in which you have something to the third power. And if you had y equals x to the third, if we did a graph of that on our graphing calculator, that would be something like so. And then if we added other things, it would shift the graph, move it up, move it over, and make the steepness and all that. That would be in uh, your pre-calculus course. They would do some of that. So part of this is as we look at data, and they're talking about fitting polynomial functions to data, they're often, offer, often wondering what kind of data is it. Well, again, if it's cubic, then we'd end up with something that looks like this that we're talking about. Now, uh, there are calculator programs that you can use. Again, we're not featuring that. That you can take your data, put it in there, and it will give you uh, a sort of function. And again, we're not doing that, but that's what they're referring to here. So, again, graphing calculators are fantastic in terms of figuring out lots of stuff. Okay, I'm going to actually do a little program, but I'm going to keep it separate from this. Uh, that will complete our work in Chapter 5. Again, you want your mastery so that when we take the test on Chapter 5, you will be ready for it.